Hello, everyone. Good evening. Welcome back to another episode of the Mob Archaeologist. I'm Angelo here with Eric. Unfortunately, Rick and Tony aren't going to be able to make it. Today, we're talking about Philly. I mean, Philly was really my introduction to researching this on a deeper level because so much information was already out there. You know, you have the Anastasia books, which cover pretty much from like the late 70s up through the 90s into the 2000s even. So there was a lot of information there. He did such great work. Um, but still, you know, I, I had questions beyond that. And then I found Celeste Morello's books. And she was really my introduction to actually thinking about the ethnic aspects of this. So these aren't just Italian Americans. They're not even just Sicilians and Calabrians. These are people from specific hometowns because she got into that, that, you know, Philly had these, they didn't just have a Sicilian faction, they had deeper roots in specific communi in Sicily, and they kind of had their own, you know, tighter knit groups within the family even earlier on. And so her books dealt with basically the early history, the earliest known history we have of the Philly Mafia, up until Bruno became boss. That's the whole, her book series is called Before Bruno. And then there was this gap that was left open between the late 50s and basically 1980, where there's no books on the Bruno era. Everybody knows about Bruno, but Anastasia's books really only deal with the last few years. And so that's what led me to start looking into FBI files, genealogical research, just everything I could. And that's really, I mean, doing this episode, this is kind of how you and I started talking many years ago. Like some of the first phone calls we had were really about Philly. Yeah, Philadelphia is a guilty pleasure. No lie there. It's really one of the most interesting and exciting families, arguably, in the world. It has everything. It has the cultural aspects, like you mentioned. It's also got blood, bullets, wars, double crosses, everything you could look for. Philadelphia is really the most written about family, probably in the world. Between, like you said, the Celeste Morello books, three of them that cover 1880 to 1959, and then you got FBI reports, which kind of supplement that gap between Morello and Anastasia, like you said. And Anastasia's been terrific in covering the Scarfo years, the Stanfa years, the beginning of the Natale, Merlino years. And then you have George Frezzalone, who was out in Jersey. A lot of his stuff was, was the inspiration used for elements of the Sopranos, which he later sued over. And then you had Ralph Salerno. Joe Salerno. He was an associate of Scarfo. Then you have Scott Bernstein's book, his one on Leonetti, which amazing work there. Philadelphia is, there's a lot there, but as much as we know, there's still a lot more to learn. It's very interesting. It was Joe Salerno, Joe the plumber. He wrote that book. Yeah, Ralph Salerno's the detective. He was the NYPD guy. <laughs> right. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it's funny you mentioned Blood Oath, too, George Frezzalone's book, because that was actually the first Philly book I read. And it's not even about Philly, not directly about Philly. I, I, I don't even know how I found it. I got a copy that some library had gotten rid of. And I really credit that book with kind of helping me understand what the mafia actually is, where I was new to the subject. I'm reading this book by a guy who's a Newark-based associate and member of the Philadelphia family, he spends more time with New York members, including actually in New York, than he does members of Philly, you know, so it's this, this remote crew that has affiliation with Philly. And so that kind of, you know, it's a little confusing if you don't know this subject, like if you think that it's all about guys from the same neighborhood and uh, some of the more obvious aspects of the mafia, it, it kind of throws you for a loop, right? I had read Gravano and Velacci, and now all of a sudden there's this book about this New Jersey crew. And I didn't even know who a lot of these guys in the book were. Like he, he'll reference Scarfo, who I, I knew who that was, but he mentions these other Philly guys. And I'm just like, I don't even know who these guys are. And so then that led me to actually read Blood and Honor, which I think I read that in two days. I just, I couldn't put it down. But that was when I started to really want to know more about the organization where I wanted, I was like, 
No, I'm actually interested. Who was the captain before this guy? When was there a ceremony? When was this done? Like, how did they do this? Who was this guy connected to? Because you read Blood and Honor and like it, it deals a little bit with there's relatives of guys in the book and stuff, but you wonder like, where did these guys come from? Like, where did Joe Changalini come from? He just shows up as, a, as an important member, but that's when I started kind of backtracking and looking into the, the 1950s, 1960s. And then it just opened up a whole world. Some of these guys go back generations. Some of these guys are from clans that have been active in Philadelphia, going back to the turn of the century going back to the 1920s, 30s. And Morello's book, you know, I, I credit Celeste Morello with so much, but there's things that I, I disagree with, you know, her perception that bringing mainlanders in is what essentially criminalized the mafia, which I don't see the mafia as a strictly criminal entity, but the Sicilians had plenty of crime going on. It wasn't just bringing in some Calabrians that turned it into that. So like, like you know, she kind of leans that way, but you know, she did such phenomenal work pre-internet. You know, she was doing that stuff, I think, as far back as the 80s, definitely the early 90s when she was in college. And uh, I just went from there, you know, and the the Bruno era in particular, like everybody knows who Angelo Bruno is, but I'm not sure that people really know who he was beyond some of what you'll see in documentaries and that kind of thing. And the also Don, the gentle Don, yeah. <laughs> And what's funny is you and I talked about doing a video, I think it was like seven years ago, eight years ago, maybe you had an idea of wanting to do YouTube videos, not a podcast, but kind of just informative videos about the mob. And the idea we had was to deal with Angelo Bruno. And so now we're kind of doing it, you know, which is yeah. funny, but when it comes to the Bruno years, there's no one better than you. You have looked into that. You have exhausted that. I'm more the early 1900, 1920s guy. So, yeah, Morello's book deals a lot with Bruno. There's some stuff I've found that disagrees with some of what Morello said. Like, for example, like she says Bruno was made in the 30s, which he wasn't. He was recorded in a meeting with Joe Magliocco, the Colombo leader. And it, it was a meeting over the linen business because the Profaci Magliocco guys were deep into linen. And they're discussing like a, I think it's a dispute over a linen business, some investment. Naturally, it goes deep into mafia politics. At that time, Megliocco was, he considered himself the boss of that family. And Bruno's having to explain to him, you know, no, you weren't recognized by the commission and you haven't come in and met with the commission. So we don't consider you the boss. And Megliocco is like, when were you made? And Bruno says around 1951. I don't know that he says the year, but he says 11 years ago or something, 10 years ago. And we have it from Bruno himself. He didn't become a member until 1951, which might seem kind of late, you know, in a family where there's guys who had been made, who knows how far back some of the guys in the family had been made at that point. And you have the boss saying he had only been made less than a decade before he became the officially recognized boss. But uh, yeah, as far as Bru who Bruno was, he gets called the docile Don. And I do think he was a diplomat. I think that he was a guy who did, I think he saw himself as the representative of these men and he didn't see himself as a crime boss. And that's very clear on the wiretaps because the FBI had a lot of wiretaps of him. And he always refers to himself as the representante officiale. You know, he sees himself as the official representative. He's very formal. And, you know, he seems to understand all of the rules, all of the protocol, even at the highest level, because when he became boss, he didn't just become boss of Philly. He was also given a seat on the commission. And he seems to understand it extremely well. And Megliocco even says, you could teach me how this all works. You know, you can teach like here, Megliocco had been made since the 20s. He'd been an underboss for decades. But he's like, wow, you you can, I can learn a thing or two from you. But what's interesting about it is if you look at Bruno from the outside before he became the boss, he's kind of like a syndicate type guy. He's got the pencil mustache. He's involved in Cuban and Dominican casinos. He's spending a lot of time in Florida. He's close to Jewish racketeers. He doesn't come across like a traditional Cosa Nostra guy before he becomes the Angelo Bruno we all know. But the reality is he came from a mafia clan. 
And he was born in Villalba and he came to the U.S. as a baby. And his family actually went to Trenton before Philly. His father was living in Trenton and there was a community of people from Villalba there. Mm -hmm. And he ends up moving to Philly. He gets involved in both business and street crime. He's kind of a jack of all trades. He is linked to some murders. He was a suspect in some murders that he was never convicted in. But he's definitely one of the most prominent associates of that family. He's a major earner, as they call it, you know. And uh, then in 1950, uh, a source later reported that in 1950, Angelo Bruno and Phil Testa were shooters in the murder of a guy named Pepe Longo. It was a nickname. This guy had said that Frank Nicoletti's wife, who was a retired prostitute, he said that Nicoletti's wife had had an affair with Salvatore Sabella, the former boss, and we'll get into him. So the family decided he deserved to die. And so the source reported that Bruno and Testa were the shooters who killed Pepe Longo and that Frank Nicoletti, who I believe was already a member, drove the, he was the driver. Interestingly, that's late 1950. And then Bruno, by his own admission, got made around 1951. And a source said that Phil Testa and Bruno were actually made together. And so it makes me wonder if, if that's how Angelo Bruno officially made his bones, because we know Philly like to they like their members to commit murders you know scarfo required it and people tend to think oh that's just scarfo he's bloodthirsty he wants everybody to get their hands dirty looks to me like maybe bruno who who was connected possibly to some earlier murders but it looks to me like he might have made his bones with the pepe longo murder and they made him and phil testa together for sh for being the shooters there Philly really seems very traditional in that regard. Detroit's kind of the same way when it comes to commit something like that before being allowed in as members. You see that in other families. What's interesting, though, is that there's members who we thought were made for a very long time, decades even. And it turns out, nope, they were, you know, within the last five years, the last 10 years. And it's it just goes to show that you really need an inside member to tell you what is going on. Luckily, with Philly, we kind of have more than a few. Yeah, that's the nice thing. is even way back when in the 60s. Yeah, they had uh, some of the informants who were giving this information were Rocco Scafidi, who was a made member. His oh. family came from Belmonte Mazzano. His father had been a captain. His uncle was a captain. Some in-laws, one of them was a captain. You know, the Scafidis were a real Sicilian clan. They were some of the leaders of what was called the Sicilian faction which many sources report there was this strong ethnic factionalism with the Sicilians and the Calabrians. And we can get into kind of what that means. But, you know, so you had Rocco Scafidi, who wasn't just cooperating. He was a couple of times he wore a wire and that was unprecedented. A made member wearing a wire. I think Scafidi might have actually been the first made member to wear a recording device and record other members. And then the other one, the huge one, is Harry Riccobini, who was serving a, a massive prison sentence for heroin trafficking. His family was Sicilian. His father had been a member. He later uh, did interviews with Celeste Morello, where he gave a lot more insight into the early family. And uh, so he, he was giving some information from prison. So you had two excellent sources willing to fully cooperate. You know, Riccobini, he was a little weird about some stuff, but he still gave a lot of high quality intel. And then a lot of that focused on Angelo Bruno, who by all accounts was a popular figure for the most part. He was well liked nationally. He seemed to be good to his members. And, you know, he did have a reputation. He wasn't a bloodthirsty guy. But he had killed some people or he was he allegedly killed some people. But then we have examples, you know, where Phil Leonetti talked about this, where there was a guy, Reds Caruso, and he did something wrong. I think he insulted a member or something. And so Bruno said, kill him, but don't just kill him. I want him strangled to death. So while Bruno might not have been ordering murders left and right, you know, it's not exactly docile to say, kill this guy, but specifically strangle him to death. And as Leonetti said, Scarfo just impulsively shot the guy. And then after the fact, they decided to put a rope around his neck to make him look like he had been strangled because they were worried that Bruno would be upset they didn't do that. And that tells me that, you know, Bruno, he might have shied away from killing people unnecessarily, 
But if they were if they were scared about the fact that they shot this guy to death rather than strangled him to death and wanted to appease Bruno by strangling him after he was already dead, it tells you a little bit about Angelo Bruno that, that maybe he was a little more fearsome than you know than they make him out to be. You know, too, his rise as boss because you know, I mentioned that he was made around 1951. He was a soldier in the crew of Dominic Polina. And Polina was from Kakamo, and he was just, he was an old school Sicilian who pretty much just kept to the neighborhood. He was involved in loan sharking, I believe, and, you know, just some of the basic rackets, just your real old minded Sicilian member. And Bruno was, of course, part of the Sicilian faction, being Sicilian himself. But in, after Appalachian, the boss, Joe Ida, who was a Calabrian, he fled the country, and so the family was led by some acting leaders. Uh, one of them was Dominic Oliveto. His family was from Potenza. He was part of the Camden Group, which had been under Marco Reginelli, who was a powerful underboss. He, Marco Reginelli was really the guy who ran the family between the 1940s and mid-50s, and then he died. For some reason, he was never the boss, but the bosses like Joe Ida and uh, before that, Joe Bruno, they lived in North Jersey, you know, so talking about George Frezzalone and the idea that there was a, a remote crew up there, there were remote bosses, two, two bosses in a row lived in North Jersey, they lived in New Brunswick. And uh, so Dominic Oliveto, who was apparently the conciliary and then underboss based on some reports, he's the acting boss. But he's caught up in Appalachian and has to step down. They then make Joe Rugnetta the acting boss. And then eventually he has to step down and they make him the underboss. And Dominic uh, uh, Polina, he becomes the acting boss and basically the heir apparent. And Bruno was recorded discussing this. And he says, you know, when Polina became the acting boss, the boss, uh, he asked me to be his underboss. And I turned it down. And then he says, Polina said, well, if you're not going to be underboss, I want you to be a Capo de China. Bruno says, I'll only be a Capo de China if I can live full time in Florida and have no members under me. And so Polina didn't like that either. You know, it's insulting to turn down a promotion, especially when this guy's a soldier in your crew. He was offering Bruno to be part of the leadership and Bruno was snubbing him. So Polina starts going around telling other members, I'm going to cut Bruno's legs off. I'm going to chop his legs off. And they interpreted that as a threat. They thought, okay, they're going to kill Bruno. Uh, Polina's going to kill Bruno. So this gets escalated to the commission. They have a commission meeting in South Jersey where Polina's asked, like, are there problems between you and Bruno? And Polina says no. But then these other members, one of which was Ignacio De Nero, he says, no, no, Polina said this to me. He said he's going to chop Bruno's legs off, this and that. So Polina was lying to the commission, and the commission says, we're not going to recognize you as boss, and we're going to take you down. So that's what opens the, the void for Bruno. And apparently, according to Bruno, and I do think he was fairly honest. I don't think this was self-serving, even though it sounds that way. He says the family came to him and said, we want you to be the boss. He said, I don't want to be the boss, but the senior members urged him to take it, and he ultimately did. We know Carlo Gambino came into power around that time. So all of a sudden, Bruno was a soldier made for just maybe seven years, and then now he's not just the boss, he's also sitting on the commission, and that's what kind of, that's the Bruno era. That's how it started. Um, you know, it, it's, it's interesting that it didn't, no violence happened. Despite all of this tension, there was no violence. And you have uh, this comment by Polina about chopping Bruno's legs off. There was actually a, a discussion recorded between the, uh, Bruno and Polina, recorded by the FBI. And Polina's explaining what he meant. Because by this time, they're friends. Because they had been very close. And by this time, like Polina's not shelved, but he's basically retired. And he's saying, I never meant I was going to like physically harm you. I just meant you had too much going on. Bruno was going to Florida, to Cuba, to the Dominican Republic. And he's basically saying like, 
I wanted to limit your mobility and keep you grounded. And Bruno's like, well, you still said that though. And so just interesting how like this one little comment got turned into a much bigger thing, whether Polina actually meant he was going to hurt him, whether he really did mean he just wanted to limit his mobility, who knows, but that's what led to Angelo Bruno becoming boss. Capo Negro, he was quoted in Morello's book as saying that he was unsatisfied with Bruno becoming boss and was talking about killing him way back in the late 50s. In terms of what Bruno said about, yeah, the family wanted him, it's important to remember that that family had several different factions, you know, and you also had different kinds of members, some who were do-nothing Sicilians who wanted to just be members, but they weren't necessarily trying to be overt criminals. They weren't waking up every day saying, how can I be the biggest criminal? That kind of stuff was an option on the table if they ran into any problems in their daily lives, such as business or social. But then you also had other members who were very hardened gangsters. A lot of them didn't come from the tradition but they took it serious. The thing with the Sicilian side, they try to play down the criminality aspect. You see that with Joe Bonanno. However, it's the oath, the ceremony calls for you to commit murder if called on. It's hard to get around that. But some people have like a very soft approach to it, but you have other members who join. They take the rules, they take the regulations seriously, but they see it different in terms of merged or mixed with a little bit of more gangsterismo. It doesn't mean that they're not good members. I mean, they're very good members, but they just, they see no need for the velvet glove, as George Anastasia once said about Scarfo. And that, that is Scarfo. Um, Phil Leonetti talks about that. Even though Phil Leonetti is from a much later generation, he did an interview that I highly recommend. It's on YouTube somewhere. It's in more recent years, but in that he talks about how when he was growing up, Scarfo told him, the Sicilians are different from us. They're businessmen. They just care about making money. Us Calabrians, and interestingly, Leonetti's father's side is Neapolitan, but his mother's side is the Scarfo side, which is Calabrian. But Scarfo told him, us Calabrians, we're shooters. We, we have to prove ourselves through shooting and violence. The Sicilians can prove themselves through business. That's what they care about but we have to do it differently. But Scarfo didn't say the Sicilians are Cosa Nostra and we're not. He just said we're different. You know, within Cosa Nostra, we're different. And it kind of it goes back to like what Joe Messino said about there was that, uh, like I think it was a making ceremony where, where Joe Messino was quoted as saying, do you guys think earners or shooters are more important? And Bastiano said, shooters. And then Messino said, no, it takes all kinds of meat to make a good stew. We need it. We need a little bit of everything. And I think that's kind of what this plays into, where, of course, there were Sicilian shooters, there were Sicilian killers, there were Calabrians who were primarily businessmen. But Scarfo had this perception that we're all part of Cosa Nostra, but us Calabrians have to prove ourselves on the street. Whereas the Sicilians, who we know, the Sicilians have those bloodlines, Bruno had them they can kind of take a different approach. That goes back to, you know, when Bruno took over, because I mentioned that Joe Rugnetta was the acting boss and the underboss for a time before Bruno took over. And then Bruno takes over and Rugnetta becomes the conciliary. Not only that, though, he was head of the entire Calabrian faction. And this was apparently a huge chunk of the family. According to Scafidi, more than half the family was Calabrian. I don't, we could probably look at the we could probably look at the numbers and see. But just from a quick glance, it's evident there are a ton of Calabrese and guys who might not be Calabrian but are mixed in with that faction, which we'll probably touch on. So you have this huge group of guys, and there's a recording of Stefano Megadino talking about because he was one of the the commission members who had to mediate that dispute between Bruno and Polina. And like all of his wiretaps, it's a little vague and kind of hard to figure out what he's actually saying. But he, he says that one of the most important things was basically making sure the Calabrians were on board and that mediating some of the ethnic factionalism in Philly at that time. And we have one of the informants, I'm trying to remember if it was Scafidi or who it was, but they said there was actually kind of a rule in Philly where a Calabrian and a Sicilian each had to sit on the administration. I don't know, there, there are some periods where I don't think that was strictly followed, but this was big stuff. And as far as family politics go, that's a, a pretty bold statement that a Calabrian has to sit on the admin. And yeah. 
you see it from the 20s up to the 80s. But then when Scarfo came in, you don't really hear about it anymore. I mean, we always hear about Scarfo, the big bad Calabrese, but it doesn't seem to have played a factor in his decision making when he when he became boss. You see it with the people that he brought in. Certain guys like Del Giorno, he didn't even check that his um, mother was Polish. Yeah. But they don't really do extensive background checks. But right. the point is, if he was from the neighborhood, you think they would have known that. Yeah, he was from South Philly. He was right. Del Giorno was from that neighborhood. You know, you think they could have checked to see if his mom was Polish, but they didn't. I guess he had, he just he seemed he he was part of everything, and he seemed like he fit. Yeah, the Scarfo era. Yeah, we don't see we don't see this ethnic the ethnic politics playing the same role they did. What we do know is Scarfo still talked about it a lot. Leonetti says Scarfo was Sigi this, excuse me, Angelo, but uh, Sigi this, you know, Sigi that, and that he, he preferred Calabrian still. And even Joe Salerno, the plumber who you mentioned, he was kind of a fringe player, not even a player. He was just like a fringe guy who Scarfo was kind of kind of recruiting as an associate. And he says he had dinner with Scarfo around the time they started getting close. And Scarfo said, like, where, where in Italy does your family come from? And Salerno told him Calabria. And Scarfo was really happy. Like Scarfo was like, oh, it's good news. You know, it's good news. You're like me. So it's, it still mattered to Scarfo, but it wasn't, I don't, I don't think they even could have used that as a major political tool. Not by the 80s. Yeah. Things were changing too much. This, most of the Sicilian faction had died off as we know it. But interestingly, one thing Leonetti said in that same interview I'm talking about is he said when Phil Testa became boss and Testa was Sicilian, but Messinese, Philly has a huge Messinese population, people from Messina. Phil Testa was Messinese, but he was nonetheless Sicilian and came up in the Sicilian faction. His father had been a member, Salvatore, the same as his son, who everybody knows. Uh, but he said when Phil Testa became boss, he made Pete Casella his underboss because he was Sicilian. And that Scarfo felt this was a snub. Even though Scarfo became the conciliary, Scarfo felt like he was supposed to be the underboss, but that Testa snubbed him by making a fellow Sicilian the underboss. So it was still at least playing out in Scarfo's mind, even if, you know, for all we know, Testa just thought, let's make an old timer the underboss, you know, but it, Scarfo felt like there was some sort of ethnic preference going on. But when you look at uh, the history there, I mean, there's reason for that, because Scarfo was related to Joe Rugnetta. Uh, Rugnetta was related through marriage to the Piccolos, who were Scarfo's uncles. And the Grandes. Yeah, the Grandes, too, are related. Yep. And uh, so even later guys, even guys who are still around today can kind of trace themselves to this stuff. But uh, some of these sources, they repeatedly refer to the Calabrians and they say that all of the Calabrians only answer to Joe Rugnetta. Like they don't take direction from Bruno. They only answer to the conciliary. But we have a recording of Angelo Bruno talking about Joe Rugnetta. And he says he's the representante of the Calabrese. He said, because that's how they do it in Italy. And now, representante means boss. It's the term for official boss, the traditional term. It's only ever used to mean boss. So he wasn't using it to say there's actually a separate organization that Joe Rugnetta presides over. But he's saying that this political division is so distinct that Joe Rugnetta is basically the boss over his own paisans, his own people. And Scarfo came up in that and uh, many other guys. What's interesting, though, is, you know, I mentioned Phil Testa being Messinese. Another guy who was from Messina was uh, Frank Sindone, and he came up around the Sicilian faction. But then you have the Merlinos, who are Messinese. They came up around the Calabrian. Whether that was all, like, written in stone, like, you're part of the Calabrian faction, I don't know. But... We see these sort of uh, places that fall outside of just strictly Sicilian, Western Sicilian, and Calabrian. It's kind of this gray area where you might be from Messina, you might be from Abruzzo, because Philly, in addition to having a huge population from Messina, Philly is one of the centers of immigration from Abruzzo. Angelo Bruno's wife was from Abruzzo. Marco Reginelli, a number of really important members were Abruzzese. But where they kind of fell in depended on who they were close to. And Leonetti made some mistakes in his book where he says Joe Cangolini was a Sigi. The Cangolinis are Abru from Abruzzo, at least the paternal side. But that could tell us that Cangolini came up around the Sicilians. So the perception was that he's Sicilian. Uh, I think it's true for these, these guys from Messina as well. Our buddy uh, 
Nino Calderone. He talked in his book, he's a Sicilian pentito, one of the leaders in Catania. He talked about Angelo Bruno coming to Sicily and meeting with him. And it was a big deal. Like having a meeting with the Philadelphia boss was a great honor. But he says Bruno was trying to visit the villages that his members in Philadelphia came from. And he wanted to know if there were mafia families there. And so he asked him about the Testa's hometown. I don't remember the name of it, but it's in Messina on the coast. And Bruno asked him, like, yeah, that's it. And Bruno asked him if that has a, a mafia family. And Calderone said, no, I guess at that time it didn't. But it tells you something that, you know, he saw Testa as a Sicilian. And when he was in Sicily, he wanted to go there or he wanted to at least know like what kind of group existed there in Cosa Nostra. Just an interesting thing, like how, how much these guys cared about them, you know? It's not too far away from Villalba. It makes me wonder if that family might have been not just confined to Villalba itself, but in other surrounding towns. You do see that in other cities in Sicily. That's one way how Sicily and America kind of mirror each other. You have some families like Tampa or Kansas City that are just solely confined to those cities but then you have other cities like cleveland or pittsburgh or new england and they're multi-city multi-state organizations and what, what speaks to that too is that in in his book calderone says the catania family originally wasn't its own family they were made into a palermo family so they were remote members on the eastern coast who reported to palermo and then they were eventually given recognition as their own group so yeah you could because he he does say something about testa's hometown like at that time they didn't have a family which could mean they eventually had one and the testas what's interesting about them is they lived in pittsburgh before philly um i don't know if they had any connections there not much is known about salvatore testa beyond the fact that he was a made member. Uh, there was a report, there's an FBI report that says Phil Testa didn't get made until after his father died. His father died in 1950. Since Testa was apparently made with Bruno, he was made in 1951, so that makes sense. But uh, Testa and Bruno were incredibly close. Like They apparently committed this murder together. Bruno becomes boss. He promotes Testa to Capo de China. Bruno's underboss is a guy, Ignazio De Nero, Who's, who was born in Palermo, an FBI file says he was made in the 1930s. He's one of Bruno's biggest advocates. He's, he's really the guy who, he's the one who went to the commission about Polina and said, hey, Polina's starting all these problems with Bruno. You guys got to do something. So Bruno makes him his underboss, but then De Niro tries to go to the commission about Bruno and raise some kind of issue about him. So Bruno basically, he keeps him as underboss, but he essentially strips him of his power and from that point on, Phil Testa is basically the de facto underboss. He's not official underboss or acting underboss, but he's the guy on the street who Bruno goes to to make sure things are running, you know? So they have this close relationship at that time. And then he's dealing with the Calabrian faction, who was so powerful that Rocco Scafidi talked about an induction ceremony they had planned. And this is in the late 60s, where there were a bunch of members proposed. The family hadn't really made many people for years. And Rugnetta says there's no Calabrian candidate. And uh, he, so he says there's no Calabrian candidate. And you guys want to hold the ceremony in South Jersey, which is Sicilian territory. We know the, the Scafidi group was dominant in Vineland and the Bridgeton area. So Rugnetta raises this beef about a ceremony because there's no Calabrians being inducted and they're going to hold the ceremony in so-called Sicilian territory. So Bruno goes to the commission and he says, hey, my conciliary is protesting the ceremony. And the commission sends word back that says, you can do the ceremony, but only if you agree to Rugnetta's terms. So this is a boss not being able to do a ceremony whenever he feels like it, because the Calabrian conciliary is saying no. So that tells you something about the political weight. This guy is head of his own dominant faction, and he has the power to essentially delay a ceremony. That's a, it's a lot of power in it's not what we think of when we think of the Tom Hagen conciliary who's just there to whisper in the boss's ear, or even the old time, you know, even outside of like the godfather use of conciliary. It's not even like what people assume about that role when it's an old retired member who is basically just there to give the boss advice. This is a guy who has a lot of power in his own right. 
Well, segueing back to Harry Riccobini for a second and the information that he gave, factionalism in Philadelphia that we speak of, the Sicilians and the Calabrians, he provided information that Giuseppe Trena from the Gambinos sponsored Salvatore Sabella to take over the family in the 1920s. And he provided a list of members. Among the earlier members, he says, was Francesco Borale. He was from Belmonte, as was Gaetano and Giuseppe Scafidi. So we got three there. Another one was Domenico Polina. He was from Pacamo, like you already said. And then you had Mike Maggio. He was from Campobello. And then Mario Riccobene, Castro Giovanni, Salvatore Testa, Messinese, like we said. And then you had Salvatore Sabella, obviously the boss from Castellamare. But then, and this is in the 1920s, you had Marco Reginelli. He was Abruzzi. You had Domenico Festa. He was Calabrian. You also had Giovanni Scopoliti, who arrived in 1902. So a lot of this stuff goes pretty far back. 1920s, for this to have started, would have been way too late because... People from these areas started arriving between 1890 and 1900. And Celeste Morello, going back to her, she wrote, and this seems to, Harry Riccobene seemed to have gone along with it, that there were multiple bosses before the 1920s. And then we look at this, and she provided the names. The first one's going to be Frank Barale, Belmonte Mazzano. He was born 1882. He arrived in the 1900s. Then you had Mike Maggio. He was born in 1889. He arrived in 1906. And then you had George Catania from Cacamo. He was born 1877, arrived 1900. He's not on that list that Harry Riccobene provided. That list in the early 1920s is probably not comprehensive. And the interesting thing about where these guys lived in the 1920s is it wasn't just in Philly. They were, it was Philadelphia, it was in Chester, it was in South Jersey. They were going up north into Bristol Township. You even had one member living in Newark. This group predates the 1920s, and it's common knowledge to us, but there's still a lot of people that think that 1930s was the starting point. But no, the, the roots for Philadelphia really began probably at the turn of the century. This goes into a theory that you have. It seems to not so much be a theory in terms of it's something that actually happened. We just don't know the ramifications of that. That in the 1920s, like you said, that there was consolidation of certain groups. You see that in Michigan with Troy, Flint, Saginaw, and then there was Buffalo and Utica. So Philadelphia might have followed that similar trend. There might have been the Belmontes that were in South Jersey. Then you had the people from Cacamo that were in Philadelphia proper. Maybe they did get consolidated in the 1920s. It would make sense because Philadelphia was the hub for that area, for that South Jersey, Southeastern Pennsylvania area. All these different factions kind of encountered each other you know, mostly on Christian Street. So it would make sense. You just opened a whole can of worms <laughs> on that one. Because uh, another example, because, yeah, it's it's not so much a theory at this point because yeah. we know it happened. In addition to the examples you gave, uh, Chicago, there was a Chicago Heights family that was Gentile confirms. There was a Chicago Heights family that was, we don't know exactly how or exactly when it was disbanded, but it still existed through most of the 1920s. There's a Gary family. Bob and Saro knew about a Gary family. Uh, there's evidence of a, of a Gary family. There's circumstantial evidence that supports that. So it looks like Chicago absorbed a Chicago Heights and Gary family at some point. The Philly thing actually is what got me thinking about that originally, which is it's not just that Morello identifies these Compaisani, and for those unfamiliar, that refers to people from the same hometown, the same Sicilian or Italian hometown. It's not just that Morello identified these separate Compaisani-based families. That comes from Riccobini. He told the FBI in an interview that when he was a kid, and he was born, I think, in 1910, and he was made in when he was six, he was almost 17, because they used to make guys young. But Riccobini said when he was a kid, there were more bosses who, who each had about 30 members under them. And he told the FBI that, but he didn't elaborate. Later, when he was in prison, he was cooperating, he was doing interviews. He did interviews with Morello. He did some TV interviews. 
he specifically said that originally Philly had multiple families, each under their own boss, and you had to be from the same hometown or, or region. We don't know if that was that strict. You know, if you were from a neighboring village, you know, you I, I don't know that they would have excluded you. But he definitely saw this as, you know, Compaizani based groups. And the ones Morello identified were Kakamo, you, you mentioned them, Kakamo, Belmonte, Mizzano. Uh, there was another from Anna, what was then Castro Giovanni, where the Riccabinis came from. And it makes well, were they really? Mm -hmm. But it makes sense when you look at the, the Sicilian mafia, where families are based around people from the same town, many of them interrelated. And so it makes sense that when they first transplanted to the U.S., they aligned in groups that followed the same principle. But then Americanization would have led them to merge into pan-Sicilian groups, where guy Paisani from different areas would then form together. So we don't think of that as Americanization because they were still Sicilian, but that's absolutely Americanization because it wouldn't have happened in Sicily. You wouldn't have guys from Kakamo being part of the same family as guys from Campo Bello de Mazara, you know, and the merger seems to have happened when Sabella became boss. That's all I can figure because the family was fully merged when Sabella's boss and Riccobini's references go back to before he was a member. But if he said it was when he was a kid, that had to be the 1910s. So it would make sense that when Sabella is appointed boss, elected boss, that's when these, these guys merged under one family. And that seems to have played out around the country. You know, it seems to have been, like you, you mentioned Buffalo, I mentioned Chicago. There's some other circumstantial evidence in other places. Um, but that's a big revelation about mafia history, that it's not just, it wasn't always just the same families we know. New York had five families. You know, as you your guys' article talks about, there were three at one point, and then they split, and then we ended up with five. So Philadelphia may have been like a smaller New York at one point. I mean, I would say they were. I mean, if it comes from Riccobini and we have other supporting evidence, Philly had possibly three or four families. And that list, you know, that list you're referring to, it actually comes from Scafidi. Um, Scafidi, not Riccobini. Okay. Yeah, it's hard. Sometimes it's hard to figure out exactly who was saying what. Because uh, Scafidi's right. brother, yeah, Rocco Scafidi was made in 1950 and then shelled for 10 years. And then he was taken off the shelf and started cooperating and his brother Sam had been a member for way longer. I think Sam was made in the possibly the 30s. And Sam told him what that information you gave. Sam said, oh, when the family started, when the family was under Sabella, these guys were members in the 20s. So that came from Rocco Scafidi, who was carrying the information from his brother. But it still, it does, it raises questions. Like if these guys were members, that means... Were guys from Abruzzo and guys from Calabria being made in the 20s? We know around the country that non-Sicilians were getting made. Which fit that trend. 1930 is way too late. 1920s is when the floodgates opened and you started seeing, even back in the 1910s, late 1910s, you had mainlanders who were being brought in. That The interesting thing is I have a lot more information on other cities to know that there was a lot going on in these cities in the 1900s and the 1910s. We're talking 20 years. When it comes to Philadelphia, though, not a peep. Philadelphia, before 1920, there's it's very hard to research. It's very hard to look up. There's not a lot of concrete information. And we know something was going on. We just don't know what was going on. Your point about members being brought in that early I think a good potential candidate for Sabella's underboss might have been John Scopoliti from Calabria. John Scopoliti and Scopoliti, that name is, that's, that's a Calabrian name that carries some cred. He ended up moving, I think, to Atlantic City or around there in the late 1920s after the Zangi murder. I think something happened that caused some kind of tremendous blowback for both Sabella and Scopoliti due to that Zangi murder. And Sabella might not have voluntarily stepped down. He might have been forced down. Wasn't there something that he was on the shelf for 10 years? Right. Yeah, no, yeah. I think, I think you just made a good point about Scopoliti possibly being maybe the first Calabrian on the administration. We have no sources who I 
identified his rank. But in the 1920s, he seems to have been the most important Calabrian in the Philly family. And there were newspaper articles that sometimes referred to him as the boss, and then they referred to it as the Sabella Scopoliti gang. But these are newspapers. They're not, you know, you don't have a member verifying. So, I mean, it could be totally off, but Scopoliti, like I said, he's a potential candidate. I agree. And, and two, with him, I've seen that newspaper article that refers to him as the, the leader above Sabella, even. We know that's not true. And that, and, you know, early newspapers, we should always scrutinize them. But where there's smoke, there's often fire. And it does, at the very least, it indicates Scopoliti was among the top members of the organization at the time. And then what you mentioned, too, about the Zangi murder, we have different accounts of when Sabella was taken down. They all seem to agree that it wasn't his choice, or at least if it was his choice, he was pressured to do it. We have Riccobini, who was made under Sabella around 1927, and he says that Sabella was involved in the castella Morese War, which makes sense given that he's Castella Marais and he's a relative of Magadino. Sabella is, is part of that Magadino Bonanno clan through the Magadinos. He was, I think, both an in-law and a cousin of Magadino and Gaspar de Gregorio. So it would make sense that as a boss, Sabella would have an active interest in the war. And Riccobini actually said, I, I want to say he gives conflicting accounts, but in one of them, he says that Sabella actually took a crew of Philly guys up to New York to participate in the war. He says it was in the late 20s, which doesn't make sense because the war hadn't started. But very likely Sabella was involved. You know, we have Joe Bonanno talks about when he was an associate of Maranzano, he had a beef with uh, Salvatore Sabella's brother, Mimi Sabella, who was a made member of the Bonanos. And he says the sit down included not just Maranzano and their captain, Vito Bonventri, but Salvatore Sabella came from Philadelphia to advocate for his brother, and Magadino came from Buffalo to advocate for Bonanno. So Salvatore Sabella, who had lived in Williamsburg before Philly, he clearly he was clearly still involved in the politics of the Bonanos in New York. So it makes sense that he'd be involved in that. But then he's also involved in the Zangi murder, which is a local conflict, but apparently people were unhappy with the way he handled it. I'd have to, I'd have to do some refreshing, but if I remember right, there was some blowback, like you said, over either the way Sabella handled it or how involved he was too directly involved or something. There was something where he fell out of favor with his own members because of the Zangi hit. Um, either way, he's no longer bossed by 1931 by late 1931. If Scopoliti's relocation to South Jersey is an indicator of when these guys lost their position, Sabella might have potentially lost it in 1928, which would make it too early for the Casta de Merese War. However, if he was involved in the Casta de Merese War and what Rico Bene's narrative is true, then that would prove that Sabella was still a boss in the 1930s, or er, in, in the early 1930s. There's a lot of stuff we don't know. There's another murder that went on. His name comes up, Joseph Bruno, not related to the other Joseph Bruno or Angelo Bruno, but he was murdered in 1925. That was another famous murder that happened in Philadelphia at that time. But his name was actually Joseph Lacasio. Came up, I want to say, around East 12th Street in New York, which that would have been gambino Verzi territory. While he was serving time in prison, he wrote a guy named John Di Natale at 735 Christian Street, and that was one of John Avena's aliases. When you start scraping under the surface for these murders, you see that these guys were connected for what went down went down. They were friends until they weren't. Or at least to me, it points that Philadelphia in the 1920s was a sizable group. I mean, if what Rico Bene said are, is correct about 30 guys each, that easily puts them at 90. There were probably different factions way back when. So Philadelphia in the 1960s might have been just as representative of what was going on in the 1920s. But to go off on a tangent, though, what's interesting to me about Philly is 
the guys today, and I don't want to talk about modern names, but like you said, they don't have the bloodlines. A lot of them go back to the Scarfos. It's not like Detroit that go back to Terracini. It's not like the DeCalvacantes that go back to Ribera or the Gambinos and with uh, Palermitan and Agrigentine roots. This family is kind of similar to the Genoveses in that it was passed on. It was passed on to these people, and mm -hmm. they have taken it and made it their own. It's still the same organization. It's still the same society. They didn't do anything different, but it's really become its own American family. You know, really no different than Sicily. It's localized. The people that they bring in are people that they know very, very well, and they are very conservative about their membership. Right. Yeah, you know, we, we've seen examples in recent years where guys, brothers who have been around forever had to wait until 2015 to get made. They had to wait till their brother was out of prison to sponsor them. They're not just bringing in all these guys. But no, you make a good point that, you know, we can say the name Joey Merlino. It's we're not revealing anything. But the Merlino regime really kind of does operate in many ways like an old school Sicilian mafia family. These guys are from the same neighborhood. It's basically South Philly is just like a village in many ways. They tend to prefer to bring in people they've known forever. They bring in brothers. I mean, some of these guys, their fathers and uncles were members. It doesn't go back to the beginning by any means, like you're saying. But in terms of the mindset, it's, it's kind of what we see with the Persicos in the Colombo family, where he's not from the, he was a street kid who got made in New York through crime. But then what does he do? He brings in his relatives. He promotes them. He promotes people who he's known his entire life from the same little corner of Brooklyn. It's the same thing with uh, these current Philly guys where they really have the same approach and mindset. They're very different as people in some ways. But in terms of how they actually do things, it's really not that far off. They, they, I think you just said they, they've made it their own, but it's still very much Cosa Nostra. I'm not really concerned with, I'll say, okay, Merlino, I'm not concerned with his habits, his style, what he likes to do, this whole narrative about him and compared to Stanfa, that was done for a little bit of Shakespearean drama, I think, the Stanfa as the old school Sicilian versus Merlino, the young Turk. When you look at Stanfa and you look at Merlino, Merlino has made more quality guys than Stanfa. Merlino never would make a cop. He, even compared to Scarfo, Scarfo was very liberal in who he made. I shouldn't say liberal, but I mean, if you were open to committing murder, that would really make it possible for you to get in, and there wouldn't be much of a... He was very loose with who he bring in. He wanted to size it up. Whereas Merlino, he's been the most conservative boss since Bruno, and he's made it what? 23, 24 years. I mean, he's got Bruno beat. He does. Half, half of it was in jail, but, you know, whatever he's doing, he's doing something right. The and fact that he held on to it from jail, like the fact that we all thought for many years, if you remember on the message boards, even Anastasia's coverage, even in Anastasia's coverage, the idea was that Legambi's the official boss. He basically. Not headlines. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Money, not headlines. He basically shooed out the Mer Merlino guys. The Merlino guys were now on the fringes of the organization. Then the Stefanelli tapes come out, and you have Legambi meeting with John Gambino saying, Joey sends his regards. Legambi's the acting boss, keeping things going for Joey Merlino. You know? So it's our outside perception of what was going on in Philly couldn't be more wrong. And there was a guy I used to talk to, not going to name him, but back in 2005, he said, he wasn't a jerk about it, but he said all that stuff about like, because you would see charts. There was even a chart, I believe, by the Philadelphia PD that identified the Merlino faction and the Legambi faction. And maybe there's a little bit to that as far as the relationships go, who's close, you know, that kind of thing. But this guy that I used to talk to said, that's wrong. The Legambi faction is the Merlino faction. Joey Merlino's still the boss. And then five years later, that's exactly what ended up coming out. The, the Legambi faction is the Merlino faction. Merlino, for, for all the publicity he attracts, 
for as you know casual as he seems to be about being a gangster, he's really inspired this loyalty that's lasted an amazing amount of time. I remember reading an article, and this was published, where it detailed Lagambi going to meet Merlino in prison and telling him that he's taking over the family and he's going to, quote, run things the way that they should be ran, quote. All that was just, it was all fabricated. It was all wrong. And this is very recent stuff here. And the fact that Philly's been very good about keeping that tight, keeping that information from going out, it wasn't that they were keeping it. They just weren't talking about it. If people wanted to, if the press wanted to label Lagambi this or that, they're not going to correct them. They're not going to say, um, excuse me. But it appears that Merlino and at least Mazone, they were, they kept their positions from late 1999 until, no, I don't want to go into anything too recent here, but there were a lot of things that were wrong that we thought were right that were wrong. And you know, when it came out, those Stefanelli tapes, it just all but confirmed it. And then you had other names used like, you know, Capo Regime, and it really went into the formality of it that, again, we just don't see on the outside. We, you know, we see them playing, you know, their own softball team and, and they're, all in, they're all on Instagram and we're thinking, oh, they don't care. We're done. You know, this doesn't mean anything to them. No, it does. They just don't talk about it. It's not for public consumption. Yeah, that thing you just said about Legambi and prison reminded me. There was a, a recording. I think this this was a real recording, but it was referenced in an article where it said, like, Legambi met with George Borghese and said, Joey, Joey's a cancer. And people took that and they, they were like, oh, Legambi hates Merlino. He deposed him, this and that. And it's like, maybe he was talking about him behind his back. People do that. People who care about each other do that. You know, people complain about each other. They do that. And it's just funny, though, that a single quote from Legambi calling Joey a cancer, which could mean all kinds of things. It could just mean the publicity. It could mean his name in the media. It, it, it might not even be personal. But it's just funny that, like, that one statement was added. It was treated like fuel to this fire surrounding this theory that turned out to be totally wrong. The interesting thing that did come out of the Stefanelli tapes was we found out the Lucchese family refused to recognize Merlino as the official boss. And Panisi said that too. John Panisi said when he was on the street that the Lucchese administration, Amuso and Madonna and those guys refused to acknowledge Merlino as the recognized boss. But he said the Lucchese members didn't care. He said they still met with Merlino. They hung out with him. And we know that Merlino was very close to the Genovese family. We know that the Gambino family obviously had no issue with them. So we see that different families had different takes on Merlino and that it mattered. But on a practical level, the people who wanted to meet with Merlino met with him. The people who wanted to acknowledge him did that. And, you know, there was a Bonanno captain who flipped a few years ago and he said he met with Merlino regularly in Florida and that the De Cavalcante family was even there, you know? So it's like, these guys are still in the mix, you know, Merlino's a legendary figure. He just happens to be alive. But it's you know? also, you know, it's a society. God, they do want to meet, they do want to network. And a lot of times I don't think they're always talking about what would be, what would be construed as a legal activity. It's not like these guys are going meeting up saying, okay, we got to do this, we got to do this and this and that. No, a lot of these are social functions. Money does get passed around. You've seen that picture of him with all these guys holding envelopes. Um, the thing about Instagram and these guys going online, you know, it speaks to an interesting point you made. If you want to go into that about how that could be a very good legal defense. Right. We just know each other. We're taking pictures. If we were doing something illegal, would we would be taking pictures. Well, they've used that defense. I mean, in the in the the trial from the ninety nine early two thousands, they literally used that as a legal defense. They said we all grew up in the same neighborhood together and are good friends. The reason why you know we're around each other all the time is because we're friends. And interestingly, Bruno told the family to do the same thing. There's recordings of members talking to Bruno and they said, hey, the FBI came to my house the other day. They asked about you. What should I tell them? 
And Bruno says, we're neighbors, you know, tell them, you know, me, tell them we're friends. It's, it's actually, it's re that, that it's not lying. Actually, they happen to be friends in multiple different ways, but the argument that we're all just buddies is true. And, you know, it, it actually does make a good defense. You know, it doesn't counteract the other evidence, but there's something to it for sure. And just, I want to go back to the historic stuff for a second too. kind of put an end cap on Sabella. I would say if nothing else, he may have been taken down if he was seen as a Maranzano ally, which he seems to have been, but he may have, if, if he wasn't taken down earlier because of the Zangi hit, he might well have been seen as a Maranzano supporter who fell out of favor when Maranzano was killed. And another important murder, too, that should be mentioned, we were talking a second ago about uh, these murders in the 1920s and that period. There was uh, a guy you mentioned, Giorgio Catania, and yep. he's identified, uh, Mar Celeste Morello specifically said Riccobini told her he had been an earlier boss. And he seems to have been boss of the Kakamo group. And he was from Kakamo. I found that a later member, Skimeka, I, I'm not, it's like, uh, S-C-I-M-E-C-A, his father and him were both members, and they were Kakames. And Catania witnessed the naturalization of Skimeka Sr. So he does seem to be a prominent figure in this Kakames colony. But he gets killed in, I believe it's 1927 or 28. So he's a former boss who gets killed, and we don't know why. You know, we don't know. I've seen some speculation. I think newspapers had their own theories. But you have a former boss of the Philly family getting killed in the 20s. And at that time, between, I think, 1925 and 1928, you had, or 1929, the late 20s, mid to late 20s, you had cockamace bosses in Chicago Heights, Pittsburgh, and then a former cockamace boss in Philly all get murdered. And they may have been, most of the information we have suggests those were local in nature, but we know these Paisani conflicts play out nationally. The, the Castello Marais War is an example of that. And so I, I've always wondered if there was something going on with these guys from Kakamo where they may have been killed for a combination of reasons. It may have been national, it may have been local. We don't have to say it's one or the other. But in Philly in particular, why was a former boss killed? And then this is also around the period that Sabella starts losing control. So, you know, we can only, we can't even really speculate beyond that, but we do know that guy was killed. And then 1931 at the latest is when we see this next phase of bosses who are from Messina. You know, Avena's from Messina, then Joe Bruno Dovi, he's from Messina. And so Philly now has these guys, I think they're at that time, well, no, in Chicago, there had been Tony Lombardo, who was from Messina. He had been a boss. But we're seeing kind of a transition where bosses are starting to be non-Sicilian and non-Western Sicilian. And Philly, who's, who's apparently becoming this diverse family with mainlanders, elects guys from Messina to be the boss for a period of, I don't know what, like 14 years? 15 years. And uh, we also see the guys from Abruzzo start to become more powerful. There was a guy, Tony Carfano. His name is similar to that guy, the Genovese guy. But Tony Carfano is, he seems to be some, someone of importance, but he's from Abruzzo and he gets killed in Philly in 1940. I, I, I suspect he was a captain. And then we have Marco Reginelli becomes underboss. We have captains from Abruzzo. So it's really the, the only city in the U.S. where we see Abruzzese guys become that powerful. So Messina and Abruzzo, in addition to Calabria and Sicily, become very important in this family. Real quick, one thing we should say, or at least point out, is that according to Rica Bene, he said in the 1940s that that's when Philadelphia first got its hierarchy, that before that it didn't exist. I... Don't, I'm not sure if I believe that, but that just that's something that he said, so it needs to be put out there. It does appear that there's evidence that Philadelphia had this system back in place. 
I mean, these systems weren't founded independently, and it turned out that they all had, they were all exact the same. This whole system goes back to Sicily. If there's a family that there's only 10 members, it makes no sense to have Capo de Cina. But if you're going to have a family of 90 members, then yes, it makes sense to have, you know, the full structure. But they, they don't add new ranks and they don't take ranks out. But that's just something that needed to be said is that he said in the 1940s that that's when it first got its structure. That's right. Yeah, he sa- I think he said it was when Joe Bruno took over as boss. And Joe Bruno took over in, I think, 1936 when Avena gets killed. Um, I do I, I do recall, like, Sam Scafidi told his brother Rocco, because Rocco and Sam were arrested with their father, Gaetano, who was a captain. And Sam, they were arrested for an arson, and they got burned and everything. And Sam told Rocco at one point that, like, our father was a captain back then. And so it does, I think that was in the mid-30s, though. So there could have been something. I mean, I don't think Rick Abini would just make that up. He had been a member for years by the 40s. He would know if there was a, if there were captains, if there was an underboss. But it does make me wonder if maybe there was some sort of, maybe things were a little looser before that. Maybe the boss took more of a hand in it. Hard to say without more elaboration, but yeah. maybe there was a, re, a reorganization. Maybe some captains had died and they just hadn't appointed anybody. I can only guess really what that means because I have a hard time believing though that if the family had more than 30 guys, which I guess they did, they didn't have some sort of hierarchy and structure. You know, the, the, boss. the boss would be so busy. I mean, he would have time for nothing else but to just meet with his guys every single day. He'd have to have a secretary to set appointments. I mean, it needs to be said. I'm not sure if I believe it, but you know, I'm not saying Rico Bene is a liar. One thing I wanted to touch on, though, in in terms of Philadelphia factionalism, the Sicilian and the Calabrese, and the other everything else in between, is yes, there were factions, but they weren't staring at each other down from across the street. There was a lot of overlap. These people got involved. They got into partnerships, but then when problems arose, they did kind of go into their own camps, but they would resolve it through their system of representation, not so much by going to war. And you once said something very interesting when you compared it to different branches of a business. When you look at the history of Philadelphia, we have no known examples where the Calabrians went to war with the Sicilians. We have numerous, many references to the Sicilians and the Calabrians being distinct political entities vying for power and influence. But we never have examples of them hitting the mattresses and the Sicilians trying to kill the Calabrians or the Calabrians trying to kill the Sicilians. It seems to have been primarily political, but they are almost like different departments, you know, different branches of the same company. Something like that. Yeah. And uh, beyond that, like, I don't, I don't know how they saw it, but they do seem to have operated independently within the same family. They weren't separate organizations, but they, there was some kind of distinction there. And it was understood that Bruno is not going to be out there telling the Calabresi what to do. And Joe Rugnetta is not going to be out there telling the Sicilians what to do. If, if they bump up against each other, it's going to have to be mediated. It's going to have to be dealt with. But there's just there's no evidence of tension being so severe that these guys ever were killing each other because of their ethnicities or anything like that. And, you know, we also have these other guys, like I'm talking about these guys from Messina and Abruzzo and with Messina, I mentioned that like Phil Testa and Frank Sindone, they were from, their families were Messines, but they ended up associating primarily with the Sicilians. But then there was a guy who answered directly to Joe Rugnetta, Edward Caminiti, he was Messinace, but he was one of Joe Rugnetta's top guys. He was part of the Calabrian faction. Luigi uh, Taranta as well. He was Messinace, but he, if you look at who he sponsored and who he lived with, he lived in Chester or had connections to Chester and was around the Calabrese. So Luigi Taranta was also, he was Nicky Scarfo's landlord when, right. he still lived, when he still lived in Philly. Scarfo rented an apartment in a building owned by Quaranta and Scarfo was a product of the Calabrian faction that was important to him, even though he was a bit younger. 
So yeah, there were guys like that. And then there was even a dispute in the 1950s because the, the only source the FBI had within the Calabrian faction was a guy who had been a Carbonieri uh, officer in Italy, in Calabria, who came to Philly and he couldn't be made because he was an ex-law enforcement agent, but he was cooperating, I think going back to the 1940s or 50s, and then he died by the 1960s. But they had a lot of historic information about the Calabrian group through him. You had made members in the Sicilian faction like Scafidi and Riccobini. But this guy, you know, he, he did know some things. And he talked about a dispute. And like a lot of these disputes, we imagine it's going to be over rackets or something. But there was a dispute because uh, there were the Lajana brothers who were Calabrians. And one of them, one of their daughters, I believe it was, had a wedding. And they didn't invite edward caminiti and caminiti was incensed and this escalated you know this wedding invitation it escalated and joe rugnetta had to sit in and mediate this dispute over a wedding invitation and if i remember right he sided with caminiti so he sided with a, a messinese guy over his fellow calabrians but they were all part of that group they were even though this guy's from messina he was part of that group and it raises questions about guys like Avina and yeah. Joe Bruna, because Lombardo they're from Messina. Chicago as well. Sorry, yeah. Lombardo of Chicago as well. Right. Like, like, how did they see themselves? Did they see themselves just as Sicilians? Or did they see themselves as, because, I mean, you look at Messina, this, the city of Messina especially, but just the province as a whole, you can see Calabria. You can swim there. You know, it's it, this is not very far away. And there are some more cultural similarities between Messina and Calabria than Messina and Western Sicily. So even though it's, it's on the Island, like we know the Indrangheta has cells up and down the Messina coast. There was a guy, Costa, he was made into Cosa Nostra and uh, the Indrangheta, but he was from Messina. He was originally made into the Indrangheta and he cooperated but before he cooperated, he was made in prison into the Corleone family. But you can see, first and foremost, he had been affiliated with the Andrangheta. So this is a place, Messina, that you can't just say it's Sicilian. It's, it's a far more interesting kind of crossroads between these areas, between these uh, Italian regions. And I guess to look into Avena and um, Bruno Dovi, what we know of Avena is... His son, who was a lawyer, longtime associate, he's on the Stanfa tapes. His godfather was a Sicilian member, a Western Sicilian member. Uh, Avina seems to have been very close to the Western Sicilians. But then you look at Joe Bruno, and I believe he was involved with prostitution, which is a big no-no with the Western Sicilians. He had run a prostitution house in Bristol or one of those places up by Trenton. And he also was very close to Joe Ida, who was Calabrian. So just like we see with some of these soldiers later, some of these earlier bosses from Messina may have kind of gravitated toward one of the factions versus the other. And they're kind of like a wild card. You know, they're, we don't know exactly how they saw themselves. Like, it's not like Joe Bruno would have said like, oh, I'm close to Joe Ida. I've dabbled in prostitution. I'm a Calabrian. You know, I doubt that he saw himself that way. But when you look at their relationships, that's where they sat politically within the family is how I see it. Well, this brings us to Joe Ida, who succeeded Bruno. Ida. Other way around. Other way around. Hmm? Uh, you said Ida succeeded Bruno. Joe Bruno. Oh, it's too many Brunos. Yeah, there are. <laughs> you scare me there for a second. Joe Ida succeeded Joe Bruno. Ida lives in Jersey. And... The underboss at that time was Reginelli. Reginelli. So you had two Calabrese in charge. We don't know who the consigliere was. I haven't ever found, seen anything listed. Doesn't mean that he doesn't exist. We just don't know who he is. He could have been Sigiliani, he could have not have been. But that's that's an interesting angle because Reginelli was Abruces. And yeah. he had his own he had his own little group of guys from Abruzzo, one of which was Pat Massey. Some of the other guys around them, yeah. there aren't very many, but uh, another one was uh, Skinny Razor, Scarfo's mentor, Detolio. De he was he was from I think he was from Abruzzo as well. His family. Um, there is a reference to 
Dominic Oliveto, who is another one of the Reginelli guys, he's listed in one report as the conciliary. Okay. And that's interesting because what that would mean is that the boss was Calabrian, the underboss was from Abruzzo, and the conciliary was Potenza. And I think it's Potenza that uh, Oliveto was from. Yeah, and that would also mean they were all from in New Jersey one way or another. And there's an FBI, or it's a recording Rocco Scafidi made where he's talking to um, John Capello, whose father had also been a captain. They were from Belmonte, Mezzano. And then John Capello Jr. became a captain too. And Capello says, you know, when Joe Ida was boss, we never saw him. You'd go years without seeing Joe Ida. And so he's this elusive guy, but he's obviously, he, he's on the commission, we learned. He's the first Calabrian boss in Philly that we know of. And then that speaks to some of the relationships, though, where, you know, I was talking about all this ethnic factionalism within Philly, but these ethnic groups had their own connections elsewhere where Joe Ida was apparently very close to Albert Anastasia, who was a Calabrian like him. That may have played a role in his power. Uh, Joe Rugnetta was apparently connected to Anastasia and other Calabrians around the country. So it wasn't just that Calabrians in Philly were close. It was that they, they had larger relationships. There were some Gambino members that were Calabrese that ended up transferring to Philadelphia, I want to say in the 30s or 40s. One of them, the Laganas? I don't know that the Laganas were Gambino members. I, they, I, I've never traced them. I've never traced where they might have lived before Philly. But one, you're right that uh, Jack Parisi, okay, who was, right, yeah, you. he was a Calabrian. He, he, he fled New York on murder charges. He gets called part of Murder Incorporated. He was part of that Brooklyn Docks Calabrian group that, Anastasia kind of presided over he he flees to according to his he, he was almost deported and he gave testimony he said he went to Philadelphia and then he moved to Hazleton and the and Philly had two members in Hazleton which is Pittston territory and they both answered to the Chester crew and Parisi told the uh, authorities he he actually testified this that he went to Philadelphia and then Hazleton because he was a, his cousin was uh, Joe Perugino, who was a Calabrian leader of the Chester crew. And so there's a, there's a relationship there, obviously, um, with the Gambinos, like you're talking about. And, and yet Parisi was a vicious guy. Like I said, that, that Calabrian Brooklyn docks group was no joke. I mean, these were murderers. These were street guys. And they were Anastasia's people. So that, that shows you that there was a relationship there that was more than just, hey, how you doing? But you could actually transfer membership to a group through those relationships. The two guys that lived up in Hazleton was uh, Sebastiano Restucci. He was Messinese. And then you had yeah. another guy. Yeah. And then you had another guy who was Bruno Delia. He was from Monteleone. Okay. Interesting. Bruno Delia might have been related to... Yeah. Billy, Billy Delia. Yeah. Interesting. I didn't know there were older guys. That, yeah, later on, it's Jack Parisi, who seems to have transferred out of the Gambinos, and then Joe Scaliot, who I don't know what their original name is, but his brother was made with the Pittston family, and they often get included on lists of Pittston members because they were lived up there. But uh, you had a couple guys, but they answered to the Chester crew. They were under the Chester captain. But then the Sicilians, too, you know, which should be no surprise, but... The Sicilian faction was very close to the Gambinos, too. So it's interesting that both of the ethnic factions had close relationships to the Gambinos, where you mentioned earlier how uh, Scafidi said that Joe Traina uh, was involved in Salvatore Sabella getting elected boss. And we know from Gentile that Traina was actually allowed to stand in as Dequila's substitute. He was basically the acting boss of bosses in national meetings, which makes complete sense that he would be involved in the Philly election around 1920. And Traina, we talked about him with Michael DeLeonardo, and DeLeonardo was told on the street that Joe Traina was Dequila's conciliary. And so he seems to have been the conciliary who also acted for him as the national capo when needed. And Traina was from Belmonte Mazzano, like the the majority it's of the guys... Rallies. Yep, the as well as the Casellas, the Capellos, the the biggest Sicilian faction in Philadelphia 
was the Belmonte guys. And according to Morello, they had their own family. And so Torina has a close relationship to them. He's also involved in the election of Angelo Bruno. I don't know what he did, but he was reportedly at the South Jersey meetings where it was decided for Bruno to replace Polina. And then on the Bruno wiretaps from the 60s, we can see that whenever Philly has a, a problem that needs mediation, whenever they need to get a hold of New York or the commission, they go to Joe Traina, who at that point is an old man. But he's he has this sustained presence in Philly. And, it, and his Empire Yeast Company which we know employed all kinds of mafiosi in New York and New Jersey, they have a branch in Philly, which is run by the Scafidis. So there's this business connection where they run the Empire Yeast office of the of Traina's company. And then he's also the guy that the family goes to to solve their problems. So it's not just that these are Calabrians and Sicilians doing things locally it's that the calabrians and sicilians have these close relationships elsewhere and that informs their local politics and you know it's just an interesting angle that these guys don't exist in a vacuum by any means it's all interconnected and it's all interwebbed that's something that people need to keep in mind when they do talk about factions you know the the sicilian and calabrese factions of philadelphia they might have lived in certain areas like okay chester was primarily Calabrese, but then South Jersey was primarily Sigilian, but Philadelphia was that center hub. They had people that were connected to them living in South Philly, and if you go to South Philly itself, you had people from all different places, you know, spread out within, you know, a few 10, 15 blocks. And Camden, Camden's another city I forgot to mention in terms of being part of Philadelphia very early on. And with Joe Ida, you know, we know around when he became boss, it was the mid 40s. We know he was given a seat on the commission eventually. He he's a, he attends Appalachian, he flees the country, he moves back to his hometown, which is Fiumara in Calabria, which is a little backwoods village. Angelo Bruno apparently visited him when he went to Italy. He says, you know, in Fiumara, you know, he's he's living a rustic lifestyle. Bruno says it's it's not great. It's it's a, a rough place to be living if you're used to, you know, being a boss in an American city. One really interesting thing you and I have talked about before is on that same wiretap, Bruno says Joe Ida wants to start a Decina of the Philly family in Calabria, which this goes back to me learning about Philly through George Frezzalone. Newark isn't that far from Philly. It's it's far in the sense that if you're, you know, if you have an issue on the street that needs your le needs the family leadership to intervene, you got to drive a couple hours. But the idea that Joe Ida wanted to form a formal decina that belonged to Philadelphia in Italy is pretty wild. And what Bruno said is you have to get the approval of the Sicilian mafia. Here's a good segue into Bruno's connections, which is that Bruno's first cousin on his mother's side was a guy named Calogero Sinatra, who was the boss of Vallelunga. The family there apparently was very small. Like Bruno talked about it and he joked and he said, like, the families in Sicily are so small that my cousin could be the boss, underboss, conciliary, capo di Cina, and soldier all at the same time. Uh, and uh, Calogero Sinatra actually came to the U.S. and visited. You know, despite some claims that the U.S. mafia doesn't recognize Sicilians, Bruno and Paul Gambino, Carlo's brother, met Calogero Sinatra at the airport. They then had a banquet with the commission where Calogero Sinatra was introduced as an amico nos to the commission and to Bruno. Bruno then held a family meeting in Philly, where he introduced his cousin as an amico nostra to the membership. A member of the Sicilian faction complained behind his back. This is Tony Perella, who is an in-law of the Scafidis. He complained behind Bruno's back and said, he's not allowed to introduce a Sicilian as a friend of ours. It got back to Bruno, and, and this does speak to, him, to Bruno being more of a peacemaker than a violent tyrant. But Bruno held a meeting with Perella, which was recorded by the FBI, where he's, he's like, you know, if you have a problem with something I do, come to me directly. Don't talk behind my back. If you didn't think I should introduce my cousin as an amico nostra, come to me. But then he says, I'm allowed to do that. The commission introduced me to him as, as a member. So I can do that with you guys. But Perella says, yeah, but there's a rule against that. Bruno doesn't seem to understand that. We know Luciano sent word, according to Valachi, Luciano sent word to the U.S. and said, like, don't 
don't deal with the Sicilians, don't recognize them. Bruno doesn't seem to believe that's a rule. He's saying to Perella, I was formally introduced to him, therefore I can formally introduce him to you. Perella says, though, that there's you're not allowed to do that. If I may say something real quick, though, Luciano sending word from Italy to the U.S., if such an edict went out, that only would have affected the Genovese if he was still boss. He couldn't have sent that to the commission and... The commission, most of those members, at least more than half of them were still probably had relatives that were members in Sicily. They wouldn't go for that. And if you jump forward to Anthony Caffaro's testimony, he said that, yeah, they don't recognize the Sicilians. But the Genovese family is the least Sicilianismo family today, probably in the whole country. And yeah, so yeah, it, it only, yeah, Luciano didn't have the power to tell Joe Bonanno or Carlo Gambino not to recognize their relatives who were made in Sicily. Same for Angelo Bruno. Because, I mean, we can get into that here now that we're talking about Sinatra. Because not only was Angelo Bruno's first cousin the boss of Vallelunga, which neighbors Vallalba, but the Trenton crew had all kinds of connections. And like I mentioned earlier, Angelo Bruno came to Trenton as a baby. His father was living there. There was a Vallalba, Vallalbesi, have you, have you say their, their uh, Compaisani name. Uh, there was a colony from Vallalba in Trenton. Pappy Ippolito, who was related to Angelo Bruno through marriage, his mother's first cousin was Colosio Vizzini, the famous boss. So Bruno had a, an extended relation to Colosio Vizzini, who was the boss of Villalba. He's one of the most famous Sicilian mafia bosses of all time. There's all this talk of what he did in World War II, all this. There's no evidence that Angelo Bruno had a relationship to Vizzini before he died. I don't remember what year he died. But this clan that Angelo Bruno is a part of, a made member in Trenton who's related to Bruno through marriage, is a blood relative of Vizzini. Angelo Bruno's blood relative is the boss of Vallelunga. And uh, the Trenton crew, too, like this was Angelo Bruno's group. People don't think about about that because it was Trenton. But uh, the main members in Trenton were largely from Villalba. It, you had John Simone, Johnny Keys. His family was from Villalba. He gets called a Bruno cousin. I haven't found any evidence of that. The FBI interviewed Angelo Bruno's relatives and asked them if Johnny Simone was a, a relative of theirs. They said they didn't know of any. There was a guy, in addition to Papi Ippolito, the acting captain of that crew was a guy, Charles Costello, and he was Angelo Bruno's cousin. Their grandparents were cousins. So a distant relation there, but still a relation. And so, you know, you have those guys, and then you have some other members of the crew. There was a guy, Mike Tramontana, who was, his family was from Villalba. He was a bootlegger in Jersey City, but he moves to Trenton later and gets made. There was Mike Camerata, family from Villalba. And I believe he was actually a relative of John Simone. Uh, both both Simone and Camerata were born outside of Pittsburgh to parents from Villalba. And Camerata's mother was a Mastro Simone, which is John Simone's true name. The family shortened it to Simone from Mastro Simone. So these guys in Trenton, and there were a couple others. There was a guy from Musso Meli. Musso Me, have you say that? Yeah. So this, this group of Trenton guys, most of them are from Villalba. There's another guy or two from Caltanissetta. And they all got made around the time Angelo Bruno became boss. Uh, John Simone got promoted to captain a short time earlier. And then it's like we see with every boss, you know, we don't, we don't think of it, but what did Scarfo do? He started making his guys. Like when Scarfo and Testa took over, they made their crew of associates. They were those, the guys who were close to them suddenly got made. What did Joey Merlino do? The guys close to him suddenly got made. Angelo Bruno becomes boss and these guys, his paisans and relatives in Trenton all get made. That's what bosses do when they John Gotti did it when he became boss. I think if we if we looked at the actual year that a lot of these guys become bosses, we'd probably see a short time later a group of associates that's very close to them is going to get made. So Bruno has all these relationships. He's part of a clan. I mean, it, it goes deeper where there's a wiretap where Bruno's talking about how his cousin from Vallelonga, Calogero Sinatra, how Sinatra's first cousins are the Spitaliris of the Gambino family, which was a father and son who came from Villa Frate. And so there's a Villa Frate connection in this. I don't think they're related to Bruno except through Sinatra, but their Sinatra, Sinatra has two first cousins, or a first cousin who's a Gambino member, 
And then he has another first cousin who's Angelo Bruno. So it's like, this is a clan. These are this these guys are come from Sicily, and in Sicily they already have relationships. Even when these guys are in separate countries, what do we see? Bruno and his cousin are bosses. So it's it's kind of incredible that all of this was going on, and most people don't know it. Like most people don't know this about Angelo Bruno, that he had all these paisans in Trenton, some of which he was related to, that he was a he was related to a boss of Vallelonga. He was related through marriage to Calogero Vizzini. And uh, there's even a reference in Nino Calderone's book where he says he went to Caltanissetta and the Capo Mondamento of that region where Bruno comes from was a guy named, was an old man named Angelo Analoro, which is Angelo Bruno's true name. I haven't been able to connect the dots. I don't know who this guy was beyond that, but the Capo Mondamento there has the exact same name as Angelo Bruno, his birth. So he could be a another guy that connects to them somehow that that's part of bruno's story like everyone knows he's sicilian and from Valalba, but i don't think they realize how deep that goes it makes a lot of sense why he was the guy he was he wasn't just an earner he wasn't just a businessman he was a guy who, who was really tapped into the essence of what the mafia is, which is relationship. It's networking. And a lot of our a lot of the public info about him comes from the late 70s when he's about about to be killed. And, you know, I know we're all over the place here, but I guess that's really the darkest period. Like I have some FBI files that help shed some light on the 70s, but we still there's a lot of stuff that was going on then. Like the structure seems to have stayed very static. Like aside from some guys who died and stuff, the the guys who were captains in the 60s were still the captains in the 70s. You know, Ignazio Di Naro dies in 1970. Phil Testa becomes the underboss. Joe Ragnetta dies in 77. Tony Caponegro becomes conciliary. And that's really when things seem to start to fall apart. Like there, there's an FBI report I have from, I think, 75 or 76, where they say there's two opposing factions right now in the family. There's a faction that's led by Angelo Bruno, Johnny Simone, and Frank Sindone. And Sindone was just a soldier, but he's apparently considered something big and they say that the faction opposing them is led by phil testa and nicky scarfo and scarfo was a soldier then but it shows that he was already seen as kind of part of the the leadership you know on a de facto basis but then interestingly it's not testa and scarfo who killed Bruno. for everything that's said about scarfo being bloodthirsty he seems to have believed in the rules he seems he doesn't he's not a guy who killed his boss or anything like that you know it never came out in anything other than mob father that was george anastasia's book on the journal in that book he claims that bill testa approached bruno and asked if he could start his own family um you don't hear that information anywhere else so I don't really find that hard to believe. But another thing is Tony Bananas Capo Negro. Every book has him as Calabrese, but he was actually Nabla Don, and he came from Chicago. Um, it's it's not a big deal. Again, factions, you know, they can mean different things, you know, like the Cingalinis. They were evidently around the Sicilians, so they kind of thought Scarfo regarded them as being Sicilians. Maybe he didn't go up and ask. He's consig, and he ends up having... Bruno killed, but this wasn't a this wasn't an idea of Nabladan killing a Sicilian. This wasn't what it was over. It was over, you know, taking over the organization, and he thought he had the the permission to do it to the Genoveses. And you have you know conflicting accounts there. Some say that Genoveses really just said take care of it. Others implied that they set him up to fail. But you know that's really when the family, which is you know, traditionally been a very boring, a very blue collar family for much of its existence. That's kind of when Scarfo came in there and Scarfo appears to really care about the rules and the regulations and the protocol. And he was probably more of a drill sergeant than what they were used to. But then that kind of compares similar to Joey Iupa in Chicago. We just did an episode on that. And these bosses came in and there might have been some house cleaning that needed to be done. Going back to Mario Riccabene, Mario Riccabene, the problem there was, I don't, I don't even remember what, you, you always hear about it being over money and territory. I'm not sure how much of that is to believe, but Mario Riccabene might have balked at Scarfo trying to exert himself, and that led to a war. But in that life, you know, the boss is the boss, and it seems like Scarfo was in his right. Doesn't 
Well, interestingly, you know what's interesting is in Nick Caramondi's book, in, in Blood and Honor, he says that Chucky Merlino told them, because Caramondi was an associate, you know, he was tasked with killing some of the Riccobini guys. And he says that Chucky Merlino told him, we have to kill Harry Riccobini because he's an FBI informant. Guess what? Harry Riccobini what? was an FBI informant. I wonder if that slipped. And Harry, I should mention too, I don't have as many of the files as I would like, but Rocco Scafidi and Harry Riccobini were still informing through the 1970s. Most of what people have seen is on Mary Farrell, where it's obvious that those two guys were cooperating by the 60s. Harry Riccobini was still cooperating when he got released from prison. I don't, like I said, there's, there's a lot more I haven't seen. But both of those guys, like Sindo, or, uh, Scafidi told the FBI when Frank Sindone was made in the 70s, he was reporting as late as 1975, Scafidi was still reporting. Riccobini gets released, I think in the late 70s around there, mid to late 70s. Riccobini was still informed. So Caramondi says it was a, a bogus claim. He says like when Merlino told him that Riccobini was a rat, that they were just making up an excuse. Well, even if they were just making that up, they were right. Uh, so it makes you wonder if there was a little more going on. And what you're getting at too is right, where Scarfo was a bloodthirsty guy, like Leonetti and everybody else. Scarfo liked kill like he made some comments like what does he say like i love this I, I love it you know he made some comments during murders that showed he really liked taking human life when he could i mean the thing about scarfo's reign though is when scarfo takes over as boss both of his predecessors had been killed in unsanctioned murders some of the guys who did that are still on the street some of the first guys he kills were allegedly conspirators in those murders um the riccobaney situation Riccobini was informing, he was, you know, turning his nose up at the new leadership. I'm not a mafioso, so I don't live in that world. But some of Scarfo's justifications within the world he lived in weren't wrong. It, I'm sure it was bad that he was having people killed. It's really not until the Testa murder, when he kills Salvi Testa, that it seems controversial. That seems to have been the big one that people said, oh, you know, he shouldn't have killed Salvi Testa. I don't know. I don't know what Testa was doing. Again, I'm not involved in that world, so I don't have an opinion. But up until that point, it really seems like Scarfo was justifiably paranoid and uh, cleaning house for good reason. You know, maybe not every murder, but still. If I may say something about Testa. Now, again, we're getting into the 80s. You know, I've read books. I've watched documentaries. This is, I'm not a historian in this regard. But Testa, he's made out to be a saint today. They People talk about him in glowing terms. Just this innocent guy. He was a pretty tough figure as, as a member. And he was even quoted as saying, you know, kill this guy. If you got to kill the family too, go ahead. I don't care. Something to that effect in blood and honor. So he wasn't this saint hood figure. Um, there was a you know a little bit more going on there to it. All we have are we have Caramondi, we have Del Giorno, and we have Leonetti's takes on all this, and that's a lot a lot more takes than we usually have. Again, Philly is the most covered group you know, in terms of all the information we get out of it. But even Leonetti, blood and honor talks about Leonetti pulling him aside and saying, "Look, you got to kill this guy. I'm sick of seeing Testa around." Right. But then you go to his documentaries and he's talking about, oh, now that we're killing him, now we're not good people, we're bad people. Right. So maybe, you know, maybe he changed his mind looking on it in hindsight. I don't know. I'm not. Well, here's an aspect of it, too. And that's when Caramondi describes it. He says it's really not Scarfo who makes it happen. It's he says that Testa broke up with Merlino's daughter and then Merlino started pushing for him to get killed for that. And then he says what actually led to the murder contract being issued by Scarfo is there was a meeting where Faffi Inarella, who is a captain, and he's basically the guy running Philadelphia by that point, where he's just harping on it to Scarfo at this meeting. And he says Faffi buried Salvi. And so Scarfo has all the guys under him telling him things about Testa over and over again. And finally, he agrees to do it. So there's really no indication indication that Scarfo was just like, you guys have to kill Salvi and that's all there is to it. We can see that the guys under him were pushing for this and Scarfo eventually gave in. Scarfo issued the contract. He's responsible. No question. He's the boss of the family. He approved to have this guy killed. He's responsible. But there was a lot more going on. There were these machinations where the members under him, the underboss and the top captain in Philadelphia, they were forcing this issue. 
it is what it is. Obviously, that led to the downfall of the Scarfo regime. But still, I'm not trying to whitewash Nikki Scarfo. I think the evidence about Scarfo speaks for itself. I think Scarfo, he was a killer. He was a, I, I hate the term hitman. You know, I think it gets overused. It's, it sounds ridiculous when people use it. Scarfo was a hitman. He did murders le- long before he was boss. He came up under Detolio, who was a killer. So Scarfo was a hitman. But I do think when he was boss that a lot of what he did was in line with the world they live in, that he was somewhat justified according to the rules of the life they live. It doesn't make Scarfo a good person, but I think there are more, there are nuances to this stuff is what we're getting at here. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're not talking about this in terms of decent, productive citizens, but this is a secret society where murder is on the table. If you're told to go do something or you violate those rules and looking at it from those parameters, I don't see any evidence of Scarfo really breaking anything, at least from what's been written. And this is another thing is, you know, right now we got access to the Secret Service. We got access to, you know, FBI files from the 60s. I mean, that's more than half a century ago. So think about what's going to happen 80 years from now when all these FBI reports from the 70s to the 2000s get opened up and let out. We're probably going to be very old men. But you're going to have people going through that stuff like we went through the 60s and early on. And people are going to be making connections that are going to just totally wipe away a lot of our preconceived notions. Right. Uh, Again, going back to the 80s and the 90s, there's endless amounts of books on this subject. But again, books do not really tell you everything. That is somebody's interpretation of things. And, you know, we have Anastasia. He's very, very good at this. Looking at things in hindsight... There are things that I politely and respectfully disagree on him with, like the juxtaposition between Stampa and Merlino. They make it, everything makes it sound like Stampa just got off a boat and took over Philadelphia and didn't know his way around. He was in this country for more than 20 years. Yes, he's Sicilian, but there probably was a, a level of Americanization as well. He knew his way around. Yeah. Then, you know, you have Merlino and everyone focuses on the gambling, the partying, the flamboyant, the the John Gotti of Passion Avenue. There's nothing against the rules that prohibits you from doing that stuff. What Merlino has never been picked up on wiretap talking about the organization. And given that he's been boss for 23 years, given that the people that are brought in tend to be related people around him from the neighborhood, he's been more conservative about it than Stampa has, even arguably than maybe even Scarfo has. Well, what's interesting about that too is st- with Stampa, he had multiple brothers and his father were made in Kakamo. Mm-hmm. And there's evidence Stampa himself was likely made in Kakamo and transferred too. However, when he becomes boss, and granted the Sicilians in the U.S. were in a bad place, we know Stanfa was close to the Gambino brothers of the Gambino family. We know Stanfa was close to other quote-unquote zips, as they called them. But it didn't mean anything when he became boss, because he ends up recruiting this ragtag bunch of misfits, guys from the Riccobini faction who never would have been made previously. He oh. makes John Vesey. He makes Ron Previty, who's a former cop. Interestingly, Ron Previty is Sicilian. You know, his driver is a non-Italian So he ends up bringing these guys around, promoting them. But when you actually look at like the core of Cosa Nostra, Merlino is more true to that in many ways than than Stanford, like you're saying. So it's kind of funny how that works. And speaking of things Anastasia was wrong about, I love George Anastasia. The guy, the guy's the best. I mean, really, George Anastasia, Philly has been his beat forever. He's written some of the best books ever written about this subject. Anytime the guy talks, I listen. But oh, he yeah. prom- I ever gotta go on a plane, you know, for 12, 16 hours. I, I I brought Blood Oath and The Last Gangster. I'm not going to lie. Those are books that I can read and reread because, you know, Philadelphia is a guilty pleasure. So, yeah, we, we love Anastasia here. Um, yeah. Great but guy. another another thing he I think he I think this is in Blood and Honor where it's the myth that Scarfo was banished to Atlantic City by Bruno didn't happen. Leonetti deals with that in his book. But, uh, you know, I discovered that on my own many years ago where I found FBI files that say Scarfo, he was working as a bookmaker for his uncles, the Piccolos. They had a falling out. Scarfo requested permission to leave the bookmaking operation. He moved to Atlantic City on his own, 
through his own will because his parents owned an apartment building there and he started bartending in Atlantic City. His mentor and sponsor, Detolio, you know, operated in Atlantic City. He went to Atlantic City because he had family and existing connections there. And not only that, but Angelo Bruno stayed close to Scarf. When Angelo Bruno would go to Atlantic City, he'd hang out with Scarfo. Leonetti talked about that. Leonetti, Leonetti talks in his book about how when Bruno and Scarfo were in Yardville, he was carrying messages for both of them. There was no banishment, which isn't even something the mafia really does in most cases. They shelve guys. They might tell a guy to get out of an area that he's operating there. But the idea of like forcing a guy to move somewhere as a punishment really isn't mafia practice. So that was a myth that Scarfo was banished there by Bruno. And there's actually a, an FBI report when, Bru or when, uh, when Scarfo and Merlino killed the Irishman at the diner. It's been reported or it's been said that that's what led Bruno to banish him. He didn't like the publicity and the violence. There was a meeting. Angelo Bruno held a meeting with Scarfo, Chucky Merlino, Joe Rugnetta, one of the Piccolo brothers. And at this meeting, uh, Bruno offered legal, he, he offered to find legal services for Scarfo. He offered to help him out with the case. This is a made member of Bruno's family who killed an unaffiliated Irishman. He's going to side with the member. That's how it works. If Angelo Bruno sided with some other guy who started a fight and got killed, he's not doing his job as boss. This meeting was clearly evidence that Bruno was advocating for one of his own members, trying to get him off the case, trying, trying to get him off, you know, and, uh, so the idea that Bruno was really angry at Scarfo, he probably didn't like it. Oh, one of my guys got in a fight and killed somebody. But he's not going to side with outsiders over a made member of his own group. And it's clear that he didn't. That's another aspect of this that just has to be put to rest. Scarfo was never in trouble, in any significant trouble with Bruno over that. And he didn't get banished. He went to Atlantic City on his own, operated a, a crew of associates there. Obviously, it worked out well for him at the time. He was meeting with New York guys. Scarfo developed very close relationships to the Genovese family, to the Gambino family. All of that was going on when some of these published accounts make it out like Scarfo was in trouble or just had lost face. There was a newspaper article that identifies two Indrangheta members named Scarfo as cousins of Nicky Scarfo. They were drug traffickers. The article was from the 80s, the late 80s, I believe. And yeah, it says that these guys were somehow related to Nikki Scarfo. I don't know if it's true. I don't know where their information came from. You know, the Scarfos were from Mamola, mm -hmm. which is an Indrangheta stronghold. Uh, there's n nothing out there that I'm aware of linking Scarfo to the Indrangheta. But if it's true, he had relatives involved with that. He traveled there, uh, he he traveled there and I believe is, I want to say, his second wife. Or it could have been his first wife. Either way, his wife was from Mamola. Oh, wow. Yeah. Interesting. Huh. Yeah. Because, you know, I know that there was a, a relation through marriage to Joe Rugnetta, who was from, is it Sinopoli? Is that mm -hmm. how you say it? Yeah. Rug the Rugnettas were from Sinopoli. So they're from that part of Calabria. All these guys, a lot of these guys, they're from, you know, towns in Calabria that are known today for having a strong Indrangheta presence. I wouldn't uh, make that out to be more than it needs to be, but I think it's it's at the very least just you know it's it's an interesting detail that these guys are from there. We know the Catronis in Canada were from Mamola and likely had connections. You know, again, I don't want to make it out to be something it's not. Like Scarfo had this extensive network of Indrangheta members at his disposal, but you never know. There's a lot about him we don't know. I mean. Phil Leonetti talked about how his his own grandfather, who was Neapolitan, was involved in underworld activity and was murdered. Tony, actually, who's not here, but Tony found that, sure enough, Phil Leonetti's paternal grandfather was murdered in upstate New York. So these people, you know, Scarfo's father wasn't involved. Leonetti says that. There's, you'll, you'll read on the internet that Scarfo's father was a Genovese member. Yeah, I've read I've been reading it for years. I'm not sure where that comes from. He wasn't. But uh, there does seem to be something to the family history where they were at the very least predisposed to getting involved in under secret Italian underworld activity. Uh, whether that manifested organizationally 
before the guys we know, who knows? But uh, it doesn't seem like these patterns came out of nowhere, I guess is what how I see it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, we've jumped all over the place here, just the nature of talking about this stuff freeform. But we talked about the Angelo Bruno murder. We don't need to get into everything that went into that. You know, we have some stories about it, but we really don't have a solid member source who was there and knew what happened at those meetings. We have a story about Capo Negro consulting with Funzi Thierry and Thierry telling him, do what you have to do. Capo Negro killing Bruno and Thierry saying, why'd you do that? I told you to, to take care of the problem, not to kill Angelo Bruno. And, and it's treated as if it was this Machiavellian plot by Thierry. We really don't know. We know that Tony Caponegro was brutally punished. We know that he was violated, just brutalized. Him and his brother-in-law were shot, stabbed, and violated. Um, so he, obviously they wanted to make the statement that you don't kill a boss. Caponegro is interesting because he actually started as a Gambino associate with Albert Anastasia, according to both George Frezzalone and a, a wiretap of Scoops Licata from the Stefanelli tapes. Uh, Stefanelli recorded Licata saying that both Caponegro and Louis Luciano, who was a Philly member in New Jersey that was later killed, he said they both started under Albert with Anastasia. Frezzalone says that too about Tony Bananas. So he seems to have been a Gambino associate made into Philly. He becomes a uh, the, the big guy in North Jersey, but he was never a captain. He went directly from soldier to conciliary, which is interesting. Fres alone says it was the Calabrian faction who voted him in. So he seems to have been affiliated with the Calabrians, even though, as you said, he was Neapolitan. But he really be, he, he was a big name. I mean, long before the Angelo Bruno murder, Tony Bananas was one of the biggest names in New Jersey, which tells you that, you know, being a soldier doesn't mean you're nothing. You could be the, the most important guy in Newark for a family and be a soldier. We know at that time, the Newark members reported to Johnny Keyes, but then Capo Negro makes a big jump to conciliary. He kills his boss. He's killed. Some other guys get killed afterward, like Frank Sindone was believed to have been a conspirator, even though five years earlier, he's identified in an FBI report as part of the Bruno faction. He's now, he was recorded on wiretaps criticizing Bruno. And the next thing you know, he's listed as a conspirator. There's some question over whether Stanfa and Simone were actually involved in the Bruno murder. Um, I lean against it, but I could see, I could see them being linked, but I personally don't think they were. Would you um, sit in a car and put down the window while somebody points a buckshot into the window? I mean, if this was a revolver, like, yeah, but a buckshot, you're going to get hit. Even if you're in the driver's side. So. Stanford, was, Stanford was hit in the arm and shoulder with buckshot. He was in his own car. He drove his own car to the murder scene. He gets hit with buckshot. He abandoned his car and ran to his house, which was just down the street. So it doesn't seem like a guy who knew he was setting somebody up for murder. We also have the fact that, that Stanford really didn't have close relationships to the other guys. He was very close to Bruno, though. So it's like, unless the only thing I can figure is that he was told that it was approved by the commission or something. And, you know, the other one is Simone, who, you know, S Simone, you know, he started out with Buffalo. He committed some murders in Buffalo. He moved to Trenton, became a captain. He was Bruno's top captain. You know, he was he was really the guy that Bruno could depend on. He was the captain over Bruno's relatives. Relatives can kill each other. Friends can kill each other. Sammy Gravano killed Johnny Simone, but he never says it was because of the Bruno murder. He says it was because Simone and Phil Testa were fighting over who was going to be the boss and that the commission sided with Testa. So Gravano never says anything about, oh, we're killing a guy who killed the boss. He says it was because of factionalism and that Simone was provoking warfare. So I lean against that. What's clear, though, is Bruno's murder marked the end of an era, not just the Bruno era. You know, Philly was actually a very peaceful family going back before Bruno. Sabella wasn't even killed, you know, so even, even though apparently Sabella was shelved and there were some issues with him, he wasn't killed. Avina was killed. But then after Avina, it's, it's fairly peaceful, considering how violent Philadelphia's reputation is. 
they weren't a family before 1980 that was known for war. They're not like Chicago. They're not like New York. That sort of thing just didn't play out there. And so it's Bruno's murder that really starts the chain of events that gives Philly the reputation today as uh, the most violent family. And how it all started, you know, we don't have member sources before a certain time. We have Riccobini, who was made in the 20s. We have Scafidi, who can trace his lineage back to that era. But we don't really have inside sources. Gentile says he was made in Philadelphia in the, the first years of the 20th century. He doesn't say what existed there. He doesn't say if that was one of the multiple families. Gentile's Paisan background, being from Agrigento, Philly had no guys from Agrigento. Uh, there were some in Norristown. Norristown. Yeah. yeah. Um, you, you're the one who suggested that, that Celeste Morello... She's of the belief that Norristown once had its own family. We know that there were a ton of people from Shaaka, and Gentile saw himself as kind of a de facto Shakatan. So maybe he was made in Norristown, but unfortunately, he could have cleared up a lot of stuff. But all he says, and he doesn't even talk about Philly once after that. He says, I was made, I was made in Philadelphia, and then he never mentions Philadelphia again. It's like, what was, what was going on there, Nick? You know, <laughs> it's, it's like, you know, you could have cleared a lot up for us. But uh, what that does at least tell us is that by, I don't know what year he says he got made, 1906, 7? 04. 04, okay. Arrived in 02, member by 04. Okay, so what we can at least take from that is that there was a formal mafia family in Philadelphia by that time, probably a little earlier. They're really, Philadelphia is really the total package. Like you were saying, it's a guilty pleasure. But I see it, it's a total package. It kind of has everything you could want from a mafia family. It's yep. the most like New York outside of New York, but it's also unique in many ways. You have the stuff that people like us love, which is like the ethnic factionalism, the bloodlines. But you also have the street gangster element. You have guys who weren't like that, but then you have a lot who were. You have a lot of rats. You have wars. Philly's kind of got a little bit of everything. And, and there's a reason why people are so interested. You know, there's a reason why people are hungry to learn more. They, I think out of any of the families, like researching this subject and knowing a lot of other researchers, it's a family that's easy to sink your teeth into if you're just getting started with research, but it keeps going. It's not, it's not just like a cheap dessert. There's really like, like, you know, I've been obsessed with Philly for going on 20 years now. There's still all of these questions. There's still things that no matter how deep I get, I'm like, the more you learn, there's still so many things you don't know. And so this is our, our first time talking about it on the show, amazingly. But there's a lot more to talk about. You know, we covered a lot here. Uh, we covered the major beats, some of the things that people are interested in. You know, who knows where the conversation will go in the future. With Philadelphia, for people who have not read it, they should really look into Celeste Morello's series, book one through book three, and also George Anastasia. He's been covering this stuff, you know, since the late 70s. These books, I mean, they, these are great sources of information. And, you know, we ourselves, we can have some disagreements on them. We pick little things apart. That's what we do. But we are, you know... Everyone who is an expert on Philly or knows a little bit about Philly is going to recommend those books. Right. All that together, it just, it's a phenomenal history, you know, and then you combine the FBI reports into that. you got a hundred years of Philadelphia information. And with Celeste Morello, I should say all of her work is available for free now. I had to search for those books when I was getting interested in this. But all of her books are available for free on the Villanova website, the college she's affiliated with. She also has some essays and stuff that she did for the university. And those are fascinating. You know, she did an interview with Dominic Polina before he died. He was 90 years old or something, maybe 100. I think he was 100. And uh, she discovered that despite all of these issues between Polina and Bruno in the late 1950s, that as of the early 90s, before Polina died, that Angelo Bruno's children were helping take care of Dominic Polina. They had bought him a new TV set. They would visit 
So it shows you that despite these issues within the mafia, these people were very close. And so I highly recommend Celeste Morello. Like, like I said earlier, there's little things I disagree with, but uh, I think she's a really undervalued source who was figuring some things out about the mafia long before other historians and researchers. She has some personal connections as well. She was a realtor at the same place where Salvi Testa was a realtor at the same uh, realty firm. Uh, so she, she has the personal connections as well. And she's done some, some just phenomenal work. The other books Angelo mentioned, those are great too. Um, all of Anastasia's books are mandatory. They're extremely readable. They're filled with organizational details that nerds like us love. But they're also just great stories that cover, you know, murder, crime, you know, just the social world these guys operated in. It's all there. And Philly's one of the few families that we have this comprehensive view into. And I guess just a little self-promotion. I wrote an article about a Florida-based Philly member, Freddie Felici. He was from New York and he moved to Florida and somehow got made with Philly. But I, I wrote a little article about him and his brother was a Gambino member who got killed in the 30s. He was from the Bronx. I don't know how he got made with Philly, but he did. He was a business partner of Jimmy Fradiano. So he was a well-connected guy. Um, I also delve into the Trenton crew a lot in that article because Freddie Felici was part of the Trenton crew in Florida. Uh, so just a little self-promotion. We'll, we'll, we'll throw some links to some of these things in here. We'll link to Morello's work. Um, just want to thank Angelo for doing this. You know, we, we finally covered Philly. You know, it's one of those subjects where, like, I, re I researched Philly so heavily back in the day that, like, I don't even really touch it much anymore. Uh, but, and I kind of take for granted, like, what we know about Philly. Like, you, me, Tony, you know, all of our friends, like, we know a lot about Philly and we're kind of on the same page with it. But there's still a lot of people out there who might have read the Anastasia books. They might have read this here or there. They follow Merlino. But they might not really know the true depth and history of the organization. I would um, really want to interview Nick Caramandi. I would love it. I One mean, of the most honest rats, quote unquote rats. Guy. <clears throat> when they asked him, you remember in one of those documentaries, they asked him, how do you like life in the program? And he goes, awful. <laughs> you know, he's honest. He, you know, some of these guys, they flip and they're like, my life is so much better now. He's like, my life is awful. Like, I, I wish I was still on the street corner in Philly. Uh, Karamondi's great. Just dig in. You'll find something. Yeah, there was a follow-up. It was either Anastasia's Last Gangster or Mob Files, where they interviewed Karamondi after all these years. He said, what, what did I do way back then? You're still a boss. You're still an underboss. Now I've had so many different names. I'm always somebody new, but an asshole all the time. Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> I think that's a good closing. Uh, that's a good close to this. 